Hey, John. Hello. Hey. Welcome. Welcome, everybody, to Eat Sleep Code, the official Telerik podcast. I'm Ed Charbonneau, and with me is John Bristow. And this week, we're going to chat about some news that we saw we thought was interesting and wanted to offer our humble opinions on. Humble. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some tools. First off, John, we've got Terraform 1.4 with CLI improvements. Yeah, so uh, Terraform is basically the flagship product from HashiCorp, allows you to basically do infrastructure as code. Uh, they've been iterating on the CLI for a long time. This is the latest release. And uh, they've added basically two key features to this. Uh, the first being that um, when you use the Terraform Cloud experience, it's a really nice experience. It's curated, it's really nice, it's pretty. It's not as sort of, uh, I guess, bare bones or, or on the metal with uh, the CLI that you commonly expect in terms of output. And so what they've now supported is added, sorry, added support for when you run a command via the CLI and it targets cloud, uh, it will give you that nice uh, looking UI uh, display, which is great. Uh, I think that's that's wonderful. The other thing that they've added support for is uh, facilities that utilize like a, a thing for um, what's called Open Policy a Agent or OPA. And Open Policy Agent is um, it's a it's a spec or standard that um, is part of the CNCF and uh, is used to describe policies that you can affect on various targets. So the idea is that I can specify things like. I want certain policies to be applied against my Azure instance, and I want those enforced uh, when I go to do um, a Terraform apply, for example. And so now mm -hmm. those policy results, when you evoke them, will now be emitted via the CLI, which is also a nice change. They've added some support for you know things where around null resources, but that's more of a, I guess that's more of a thing that uh, folks will use when they've got um, when they're managing resources that require you know, certain timings, uh, et cetera. So 1.4 is available now, available via Homebrew, which is the sort of way that I, I download, or you can grab it through other means as well. Awesome. So uh, Napalm is in chat. It says, thanks for the PDF yesterday. Uh, great stuff. That's referring to the uh, Blazor show that I did yesterday. Um, so I dropped this new ebook on the Telerik website. I figure I'll, I'll share with the crowd here since uh, Napalm brought it up. Um, this is a, an ebook that kind of goes through um, some of the challenges that you might run into trying to uh, architect a Blazor hybrid application that uses a Blazor, or sorry, a .NET server on the back end. Um, so the idea here is you want to break up things into separate projects in just the right way so it makes organization nice and easy. And then there's some things that you run into just with web applications working alongside a uh, Android emulator um, where like the Android emulator doesn't know what the heck a local host is. So I wrote a little bit about how you get around that in uh, the Blazor hybrid or Maui um, framework. And you can grab that ebook um, on our white papers website. Uh, so just uh, grab the link here from chat. I'll post this on my LinkedIn as well and after the show today. Uh, but that's uh, that's the ebook that uh, Napalm was referring to. It's a it's pretty um, decent length. It's not something that's going to take you more than probably an evening to read. Um, but like I said, it covers all the necessary things. Right? It's meant to get you in there. Uh, get you organized, uh, talked about testing and, and some of the roadblocks that you might run into trying to set up this type of configuration. So if you're looking at doing like cross-platform stuff with Blazor, this is your first place to start. Thanks for the shout out there, Napalm. Uh, so on to our next story, John. Is National Cybersecurity Strategy a wake-up call for software developers? Uh, sounds like um, kind of an architectural uh, uh, article that we've got here. Yeah, so uh, last week, the uh, White House released the new U.S. National Cybersecurity Strategy. And it basically sets out a framework for um, trying to protect national and critical infrastructure, including hospitals, mm -hmm. clean energy facilities, and um, all that stuff from cyber threats. Typically, you'll see ransomware attacks in various hospitals, etc. cetera. Um, we've got issues around making sure that we secure our supply chains, et cetera. And so the White House set about to uh, specif specify some of the things, uh, the initiatives that they have around cybersecurity. 
And this is a PDF document that uh, basically outlines the steps that the government is taking to secure uh, those resources and make it resilient to attack. Um, and so the reason why I think this article is relevant, this is an article from uh, GitLab, um, is because I think that for a long time, we've often, you know, us in the developer community have talked a long time about this, this idea that, you know, at some point, <laughs> governments are going to mandate that we have, you know, secure supply chains and utilizing um, bill of materials and making sure, you know, signatures are enforced and that, you know, that we have, we're, we're following all the processes that we know that are in place or that are available and start enforcing those. And so this article goes into depth about the sort of things that I think developers might want to start thinking about because um, whether we take the initiative ourselves or it's mandated through law, I think that it's, it's definitely an important aspect of this. We talk a lot about this a lot in the DevOps space, particularly around the DevSecOps space, which is basically a, you know, applying security throughout the entire software development lifecycle. And so they talk a little bit about securing the software supply chain um, from everything from source to build to your dependencies to the artifacts, etc. cetera. Um, having having a, a bill of materials or software bill, what we call SBOMs, uh, software bill of materials, and then having um, trustworthy uh, agreements in place uh, as part of that for you know, SLAs, et cetera. So basically um, there's lots of tooling available there, but I think the, the important conversation to be had here is amongst the developer audience is like, what are we doing to help, you know, mitigate these attacks? What are we, are we applying best practices, et cetera. And the reason why this is important is because obviously governments like, you know, the U S et cetera, are mm -hmm. now, you know, thinking about this very strategically and we've seen attacks and we've seen, you know, if you just read the you know, cursory glance in the news, we'll tell you that this is something we need to care about. And so, um, I think this was a very timely and relevant article. Definitely. Yeah. Security, like security accessibility, like always get thought of last. And it's like two things that need to be thought of up front. Mm. Um, I don't know how we always end up in these situations. We just want to like ship the thing and let people use it and don't think of the consequences of like what we've done. Um, yeah. It's kind of a backwards way of thinking, but it's kind of the way we do things. Safety, well, it's security. kind of surprising. We have all these industries that are out there that are heavily regulated and mandated in terms of law. And then, mm -hmm. you know, software seems to, because it's so nebulous and virtual and complex, et cetera, um, there are things in place. But, you know, I think that um, this stuff is important and um, we've got to take it seriously. Definitely. Um, <laughs> this... <laughs> This was a good read uh, by Simon McDonald. Um, he, he wrote this article, Why Does Everyone Suddenly Hate Single Page Apps? And it's like the good old pendulum swings type of scenario. Um, and he's looking at his Twitter feed and it's like uh, all these people just raging against like single page applications. Um, and we've got uh, like JavaScript frameworks, especially that are, are just now kind of pivoting back to uh, server-side rendering and talking about how great it is that server-side rendering is a thing. And then you've kind of got the third camp that's like, I never left server-side rendering. It's always been great here. Uh, so this is a good kind of summary of um, how this kind of came about and then the situation that we're in now and it's um, and what people are are doing moving back uh, to a more server-side approach or an isomorphic rendering approach. Um, and we're seeing that with, with Blazor as well. Uh, so it's not just JavaScript, but we've kind of always had server-side and client-side with Blazor. Now it's, it's kind of merging into one thing. So it can do either at any given point in time. Um, but it's just interesting to see the whole industry kind of shifting back in one uh, direction yet again. It's, uh, yeah, I saw I saw a bit of this on Twitter earlier this week. This this uh, mm -hmm. well, there was there was a bit of a, a conversation happening around React server components, and um, a lot of people were saying like this feels like the early days of ASP.NET. <laughs> so yes, it uh, does. <laughs> yes, and so um, in terms of that's that's not necessarily spa, but um, it does kind of it's kind of interesting how different camps of developers pick up on different ideas and run with them. 
and then declare it as the greatest thing ever. And then everyone's looking across the yard or over their fence. <laughs> I mean, it's it's the old adage, right? If, if you if you perch yourself high enough on a ladder looking over your neighbor's uh, fence, there's no nothing will prevent you from being either offended or impressed by what you see on the other <laughs> side. So uh, I think that uh, the argument for and against these things are. I don't know. I mean, it's it's one of those things. I think what what we I think what matters is you know developer productivity, um, features, scalability, security, all those things. So if a spa is a way to get there, great. If not, great. Yeah, it's interesting to see like you know having come from a web forms background, like the technology kind of coming full circle to the point mm -hmm. where it's almost web forms like again. It's um, you see things in don't remember which framework it is. Uh, I think it's felt that um, kind of reminds you of the whole run at server tag that used to put on or attribute that used to put on components. Um, it's just it's being done at uh, the file name level instead of the actual like um, attribute on the element level. But uh, it's still the same kind of concept. Uh, the only thing that's not quite there is that huge like view state pattern that we had. I was had just in, gonna say. I was just gonna web say. Forms, it doesn't have view state. I'm sure there's some kind of view state being shipped around somewhere with these any kind of server side rendering stuff. I mean, you gotta have some kind of statefulness there. But um, do you keep like you know, you could build good web forms apps that don't have a giant view state. It's only a problem when you're not paying attention to it and just, you know, shipping everything, tagging everything, run at server. Yeah. Sure. Get a, a grid with, uh, you know, thousand pages on it and 15 <laughs> rows. And I feel attacked yeah. here. I feel like you're looking at me when you're saying this. Come on. Dozen columns and you're like, yeah, run at <laughs> server. Put the whole yep. thing in the view state and just ship it back and forth between the server and the client consistently with every sort, filter, page that you do on it. And I'm sure that'll be perfectly performant. No, don't do that. Like there, there's, there are ways to write terrible apps, no matter what framework you choose. Yeah. Um, I think I've probably proven that over time. So <laughs> you can write very bad jQuery apps. You can write very bad web forms apps, and I'm sure you can write terrible blazer apps. So, uh, we'll, we'll continue to see this pendulum swinging stuff. I think, um, probably as long as I'll be in the business. <laughs> uh, right, John, how Discord stores trillions of messages? I feel like I need a Dr. Evil, like trillions of messages. Sure. Yeah, well, with, given- With our, laser beams the, attached to their heads. <laughs> given the inflationary numbers we have across the world and uh, central banks, uh, you know, the T word, I guess, uh, seems to be relevant these days. This is a the blog post from- the folks over at Discord, Discord is a very, very popular um, uh, chat uh, solution. It's akin to something like Slack or Teams, very popular in the gaming uh, game streamers uh, space. And uh, this is an article that talks a little bit about how they changed their architecture. Um, they were having some problems with Cassandra and they decided that we're going to basically uh, make some changes. They were looking at uh, a variety of alternatives, um, but eventually what they decided upon was using parts and pieces of uh, utilizing Rust. Uh, so yet again, another plug for Rust. <laughs> I know week <laughs> after week, people get tired of hearing about it, but uh, Rust is kind of interesting in terms of its use. You're seeing it in a lot of places, but I thought what was really interesting about this was that at the end of this migration, um, they basically made this switch back in May of 2022. Um, and mm -hmm. since that time, they've gone from running, I think, 177 Cassandra nodes down to about 72. And then each node has about nine terabytes of disk space. Um, and then they've been able to dramatically improve their latency, which is a big, big win. Um, so latency obviously is the uh the killer especially in a messaging app and you see these um these latencies creep up obviously when you have more messages occurring but um definitely worth noting that um in some cases optimizing for various parts and pieces of your application uh really do help interesting yeah it's funny you brought this up because i have a very great segue to such an article that <laughs> <laughs> Aligns with this very well. 
All right. Uh, C sharp versus Rust versus Go performing benchmarking with Kubernetes. I like so, it. Fight, um, fight. Yeah. So this uh, uh, B Sundar here, he wrote about uh, working with web APIs in all three of these technologies and kind of uh, doing some benchmarking uh, with all of them. Um, so he does some CPU benchmarking here and uh, I'm trying to remember the scenario here. This is without loading any application benchmarks shown below. So we've got um, this kind of uh, the application with nothing running in it and what it's using CPU wise. And then he goes on to try different types of loads. And uh, it's, they all, C Sharp Go and Rust all perform very well here. Um, as far as memory usage goes, though, uh, you can see Go and Rust. It's it's trim as C Sharp has been over the last couple iterations. It's still uh, being beat out uh, pretty handily by Rust as far as memory usage goes. So um, I think that's one of the the key benefits of Rust is um, the fact that it uses memory the way it does and its features with the compiler on um, catching these uh, memory usage, um, you know, garbage collection. It doesn't have garbage collection. You got to kind of manually do that yourself. I think that uh, is, is probably what's leading to these results being the way they are. Hmm. What do you think, I'm wondering John? Why, uh, I'm wondering why the author decided to deploy to Kubernetes. It seems kind of like overkill. It's like trying to dig a hole with a shotgun. <laughs> I don't know. Um, maybe it was to make this easier. Hmm. I, I don't know. On himself, maybe there's okay. there's some something behind uh, putting it in there just to make it easier to compare or something. I don't know. Okay. Actually, it's more uh, like it's like more like digging a hole with a bazooka. Actually, now that I now that I think about it. <laughs> yeah. Code coverage for Go integration tests. Yeah, so recently the Go team shipped 1.20 of its tool set. Um, nothing really major, but this one actually surprised me because I actually had missed this completely on the release notes. So um, there are built-in, uh, when you download the Go tools, uh, there's a, um, a, a cover flag that you can run when you run Go test. So Go is really good in terms of its tool set. So you have like the compiler built in with Go build. <laughs> you have Go, Go test as well, which um, utilizes a very, so Go has this sort of semantic for denoting things like benchmark tests and for uh, unit tests and for fuzz tests, et cetera. So when you say go test and you run with the cover flag, this will go ahead and execute this across your entire module, which is fantastic because it gives you the insights that you're looking for when wanting to test these things. Now, the thing that I had missed in 1.20 was the fact that now you can actually um, specify this more. It's no longer limited just to packages, but supports collecting profiles from um, larger integration tests, which is typically what you want when you're doing integration testing, these big EDE sort of tests, you want to see what your coverage is doing. That's where it's going to be really helpful. So um, making taking advantage of this will um, allow you, this new feature in, in 120 will allow you to take um, a better perspective on these sort of larger, more complicated tests, especially in the EDE scenario. So I was really encouraged by this when I saw this. I was like, oh, I could totally use this. So um, if you're running Go and you're developing on Go, Download the latest bits, 1.20, and check out the new support for code coverage across um, larger test suites. Yeah, that's interesting. It seems like it gives you a percentage of code covered, but yes. does it tell you which code is not covered? Uh, it typically gives you just what is covered, uh, but it will also say 0%, so if it's not. Oh, okay. So you can see an example so there. Yeah, 0%, so. then you go find that, write tests for it. So zero, I mean, it's it's fairly accurate. The nice thing about the tooling as well, if you're running it within an ID like Visual Studio, it will actually highlight uh, the lines that are covered, et cetera. So oh, nice. uh, Visual Studio code I meant, sorry, I should be, I should be yeah. specific. So I remember a long, long time ago, I was doing Salesforce dev. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a tool built into Salesforce. They, they required 100% test coverage to deploy to the cloud. So there was a tool built into that pipeline. Good luck that with that. Do it. Good yeah. luck with that. <laughs> I mean, there's of course ways to get around it, uh, writing sure. like phony tests. That's GPT, maybe. They're just like 
sure it checked it, but uh, yeah, there there was a tool built into it, and it was pretty handy though. Um, yeah, it was nice. I like it. Uh, talking about a little bit of uh, uh, WinForms here, John. What's new for WinForms Visual Basic applications? I, I know, know right? people still write this stuff. Um, this must have been a pretty intense article to to write. It required uh, Klaus to clone himself. I know. And, I saw um, that too. It's clearly, this uh, this actually dropped just a few minutes ago, and I, I I read through it. I was like, oh, this is interesting. So, um, WinForms and VB, obviously, the uh, I like to call them cockroach technologies, meaning after the nuclear winter of all the hype and everything passes by, the the, the remaining technologies that will live will be VB Run, the runtime for uh, Visual Basic. WinForms, uh, JSON, I believe, will be in that mix. XML. These are you technologies mean, you just cannot kill. That's why I call them t cockroach technologies. They are, they are after indestructible. Server side rendering has died. Sure. And All that. Spas yeah, have taken over and spas have died it. and server yep. side rendering is taken yep. over again. Yep. This will still yep. be here. <laughs> So um, the, this framework has been available for a while. Um, so this is uh, the framework for allowing uh, WinForms based on, on Visual Basic um, to mm -hmm. basically in, utilize features of the latest version of the .NET um, libraries that are out there. So this, this uh, update has now added support for WinForms, uh, VB apps to .NET 6, 7, and I guess potentially 8 into the future. Um, so there's typical examples of this, like, you know, you want to utilize something like EF uh, entity framework in the context of uh, one of these applications. And so this application framework enables you to do that. And so mm -hmm. there's a number of ways in which you can take advantage of this. But um, the nice thing about this is they've integrated within the UI of Visual Studio. Um, so if you take a look in, uh, at the, the um, application framework section, you can enable this capability uh, if you're building a VB app. And uh, the reason why I cite this is not because I'm a huge fan of VB, I, I, but I've targeted VB before. It's the fact that it, it's more of an acknowledgement of the fact that I know that companies still continue to use WinForms and VB. And so yeah. I think we need to have an honest, be honest here and say, look, they're, they're still tooling support. And it's credit to Microsoft. I mean, Microsoft's doing right by these folks by enabling these capabilities. And uh, there's a large contingent. And if you fool yourself into thinking, oh, that's like, dead or dying or whatever i mean i'm sorry no these these technologies continue to be used and used successfully across a number of app um, uh, organizations and so i would continue and encourage folks to look at it and should provide you a leg up when looking at utilizing these features in dotnet six seven eight nine whatever we're going to i don't know yeah so <laughs> yeah it's it's kind of interesting because you know there's some really big applications written on this and they've existed for some long period of time and like you said it, it's just like a cockroach that won't die and then uh microsoft comes out with something like like blazer for example or maui sure and like everybody's like barely like looking at it peeking under the covers they're like good it's it's just gonna be the next silver light it's like but what about all the stuff that they've built that's still around that's been hanging out for you know tens of years uh, and hasn't gone the silver light route. Like we're, we've still got these WinForms apps written in Visual Basic. We've still got all sorts of things that uh, have been deemed dead 110 times, but are still there. But everybody's going to beat up silver light. You know, there's uh, you know your ATM, your your plane, um, your the the various parts and pieces of society still run on technologies like this so i wouldn't poop oh, yeah and uh right. maybe it's my advanced years but i i'm i'm feeling like i i i'm becoming more accepting i'm not becoming as uh, hostile towards um technologies like COBOL, which is still used by the way and fortran which is still used by the way um and uh and kind of just be more accepting of the fact that yeah. these are things that are written and work well like it was pretty recently i can't remember where i was but I took a photo of some kind of kiosk that was running like Windows XP and had thrown an error. And it was, you know, on some pretty big thing. I can't remember if it was a restaurant or what it was. And it's like, I got to take a photo of this because I'm a nerd. But yeah, the, these things just, they get out there and they never die because they run important businesses. Speaking of things that just don't die, John. <laughs> I, I saw this beautiful. article. That was so good. That was so good. Thank you. I saw this article. I avoided it, yet you picked it anyway. So let's yep. do it. There's yep. 
these things, these floppy disks, like what's the article about? I have some of my own tales about this stuff. Well, you know, like I said before, there's still this old technology, like old technology still kicking around, still being used. I mean, like, I think, I think this is going to, you're going to see YouTube channels now dedicated to this stuff, you know, like, oh, I picked up an old, you know, I picked up an old 486 or whatever, right? So um, floppy disks still are out there. There's, this is, I mean, I, I, I facetiously said, you know, the dot matrix printer still exists because of the airline industry, but these technologies still be, are still used across, and they're probably more behind the curtains. Like it's stuff that you don't see, but these things are still used across airline businesses, across governments, across, I don't know, other critical infrastructure. So as much as we like to crap on um, the 5.25 or 3.5 discs or tape or whatever, <laughs> They're still making the world go round. It's not just, you know, the cloud and, you know, your ones and zeros flying over this fast internet. I mean, yeah. fast internet, give me a break. I mean, we're still still dealing with like dial up modems, etc. So as much as we'd like to think that this stuff has gone by the wayside, it hasn't. I mean, they're still they're still kicking. Work in any factory anywhere, and you will find floppy disks somewhere. That's all I can say. Like, uh, not that long ago, you know, I was working in a factory and there were machines that were not connected to any sort of internet and they ran, you know, like Windows 3.1, for example, or, or less. And yep. you would have to walk floppy disks over to these things and install software on them. Uh, they were hooked to machines that would, you know, press steel or test circuits or whatever the task was but they weren't built with any kind of upgrades in mind. It was like, this thing's gonna run on this, you know, system that's attached to a, a serial port. And that's it, that's all it was designed to do. So, um, you know, if you need to ever fix this thing, you better hope the company's still around. Uh, we had one that was a custom test rig for something proprietary and, um, the PC inside of it was in a 286. Um, and the BIOS on the machine, uh, there was something that the, the app that the person wrote accessed something on the like low level ROM on that machine. And if you didn't get an identical uh, motherboard with the same, um, uh, BIOS, Northbridge, and uh, 286 processor on it, this app would not run. Like, you couldn't go get, like, a, a 486 off the shelf from, like, Radio Shack back then and, like, just drop it in place. Like, it wouldn't work. It had to be this specific one. So at one point, you know, it was, this was, like, 2000, um, we had somebody actually going out to... Um, like these uh, re recycling places trying to find these motherboards because if this machine ever broke down that was the only way to uh, to replace the <laughs> the system on it yep. so we had like a cabinet in the back of the building that had nothing but these old computers that were like 286 you know model PCs and they were just they were just sitting there waiting for one of these computers to die to take its place that's all they were there for it was nuts. Like if it works and it's going to cost a lot of money to, to replace, like people won't fix it. They, they will just find the cheapest way possible to keep it, keep it going and kick the can down the road. Yeah. You so, know, there are entire industries that run this way, right? I mean, they just mm -hmm. procure their, their procurement department is ebay.com. I mean, they just go on there <laughs> yes. and they just buy replacement parts. So. Yeah, I mean, what do you, what do you do if you have, say, like a Chuck E. Cheese animatronic <laughs> um, rat, and uh, it takes floppy disks? Uh, well, first of all, it's a mouse. But second of all, uh, yes. So Chuck E. Cheese, mouse, uh, rat, for whatever. Those... <laughs> so for those folks, actually, I think we should probably explain what Chuck E. Cheese is. That's the that's the TikTok True. video right there. The, that's not yeah. ubiquitous. Uh, no, it's not. So one? Chuck E. Cheese, Bullwinkles, these are basically theme restaurants for children, and they're also for parents if you think about it. Because what they do is they give a space for adults to drink and have pizza, and then a space for kids to play on video games. 
And so what this video here from TikTok is showing is a gentleman who maintains the server software slash software for the robotics that occur inside the Chuck E. Cheese restaurant. And as you can see, they still use 3.5 inch floppy disks. So uh, yeah. the gentleman puts it into the controller, it loads the software, and then the robot on stage uh, that says, hey, I hear it's your birthday. You know, how old are you? You know, as it does its freak out. So that th this is uh, this is still the the way of the world, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, friends. Uh, the world still runs on a lot of this stuff, and so they're migrating now, obviously, to more modern technologies. But like CD-ROM, um, I know, right? So uh, anyway. this is an old PLC controller, is what it is. Yeah. It's fantastic. It's a programmable logic controller. This is what uh, IoT came from. Yeah. I uh, I love uh, his I, I love his uh, account name, Biz, Showbiz Pizza Man. <laughs> um. So let's do a little trivia, John. Who who started Chuck E. Cheese? I have no idea. You have no idea. Come on, my friend. Chuck. Chuck E. Cheese. So it's going to be so logical and so like slap in the face obvious when I say it. You're going to be like, why did I not think of that? Chuck E. No. Okay. If you were, say, the creator of massive arcade machines and you wanted to sell them, uh, what better place than to start a uh, kid's pizza chain with a, sure. with a rat mascot, right? So Nolan Bushnell from Atari started Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah. So Atari, Atari owned Chuck E. Cheese for quite some time. Um, it, it, it's an obvious, you know... It's the sales room floor of video games. Yeah, I, I guess I guess you could if you're if for those who don't predate stainless steel like Ed and I do, uh, <laughs> the the more modern equivalent of this is Dave and Buster's. So if you're looking yeah. at Dave and Dave and Buster's has evolved that model considerably, so much so they're making so much money. Mm -hmm. But when Ed and I were younger, many many moons ago, you would go to an arcade like this called Chuck E. Cheese, and you get like your pants would be full of quarters, like absolutely just stuffed. You'd break pockets with how much you know, monetary, uh, the thing before we use credit cards and, and Apple pay, we used to use this thing called coins. Money. Yeah. Coins <laughs> actually yeah. physical. Yeah. And so you would, uh, stuff your pants full and $10 would be like an hour of, of video games. So, Oh yeah. Uh, like the, the best old man story for this I've got is, uh, my, when my dad grew up, uh, totally different generation. Um, the arcade as he knew it, you know, any kind of coin operated place that you would go, pinball machines and stuff like that was where the riffraff hung out. Okay. So he absolutely thought arcades were just like a, a cesspool of like filth and depravity. They were. Did, didn't realize like, <laughs> I mean, they modernized though. And this is where kids hung out and they, they played Galaga and Pac-Man and Sure. Uh, turned into things like Chuck, Chuck E. Cheese and whatnot. So I would always want to go when we went to like a mall or something. And he would do the, the minimal effort of, uh, well, it's a big waste of money. So here's here's the, the least amount of money I can possibly give you to get you out of my hair. But you'll only be in there like 10 minutes and you'll be back. So one day he gives me like two bucks or something. And I go into this arcade and it's like the the holy grail of arcades. It's like two stories tall. It's in, you know, the typical 80s mega mall. Sure. And uh, they have this machine and they still have these machines out here, but usually they reward tickets now, which sucks. Yeah. But yeah. you put you put the coin in and it falls on a shelf and there's like a little, like, um, little mechanism pushing on the shelf. And when your coin falls in, you're trying to knock the other like 30,000 coins that other people they, dropped in those the system. Machines, those machines still exist. I've yes, seen they them. do. Yes. So I take my only like four to eight quarters or coins that I've got. I throw them in that machine and I won probably about eight to $10 <laughs> worth of quarters out of it. Uh, when I say quarters, I mean tokens. So these like aren't like, it's not money you can take, spend yeah. somewhere else. Um, so he walks back in like 10 minutes later, you ready to go, son? And I've got like, like you said, like the baggy jean pocket full of quarters. And I pull out this massive, like gold <laughs> glittering yes. thing. And I'm just like, look what I got. And he's just, he was so, so mad. He was yep. so upset. I, 
I, as I was speaking as a parent, I know that feeling because you're like, oh, I gave you all the time in the world and now you've, you've compounded <laughs> the problem and you're, we're going to be stuck here. And I'm, I'm here, st I'm stuck here sitting with people I don't like and I don't want to talk to. Yeah. I'm only here because you want to be here. <laughs> He he was upset. Uh, he did let me stay and spend it all, though. Um, so I do him. have to give that to him. Um, right. He did linger over my shoulder while I did most of it, though, which probably sped up the process. But yes, <laughs> uh, I remember I spending as well. quite a bit of it in uh, in uh, what's it called? Double Dragon Two. Sure, uh, that was that was pretty tough on the quarters. So I, I just pumped yes. a bunch of them in there, knowing I was going to lose them uh, in pretty quick fashion. Uh, but yeah. So cheers and to now, dad we've for, gone, for giving we go me from the... that. Yeah, we, we go from that to this. <laughs> to other technology. Like, this is your chance to trade spots with my dad and be, like, grouchy about technology, John. That's what I'm this, already that's, there. That's the segue need, we've got. I don't need the inspiration. I'm already there. I already hate technology. Um, Give me a this, break. <laughs> this was an oversell, by the way, on the article title here, or the video title. Augmented reality with x-ray vision. Eh, I don't think Superman's going to be too impressed by it. It's not the x-ray vision I thought I was going to get, but it is still kind of neat. I, I'll show what it is, and then I'll explain what I thought did, it was. Did they just wrap a decoder, like no. cereal box decoder on top of that? <laughs> Sorry. So uh, inside the box, there's uh, basically go. super cheap um, uh, RFID tags. And the thing that ray that they just taped to the front of the HoloLens is an emitter that will mm. uh, kind of power up that RFID tag and identify it. So once you do that, you can just look at the shelf and you can tell what's in the boxes. Okay. Um, I think this has some no, useful, cap don't say it. useful don't, capabilities. Don't, don't say it. I do think it has some useful capabilities. Um, no, it doesn't. It's kind of neat. What no, I thought isn't. they were going to do, though, what I thought they were going to do, when I saw the picture and the words X-ray vision, I thought what they were going to do is actually sense um, any kind of RF signals that are already out there, like your Wi-Fi router, for example, and okay. see um, – and I think people have tinkered with this before. It's not an original idea by me. Uh, but what you can do is um, you can kind of see where those RF signals are bouncing from. Okay. And you can kind of look through certain objects. So the RFI, the radio frequency will penetrate certain objects. So you may be able to like see another person through a wall type of a thing uh, because their bodies will absorb some of the RF. I thought that's where they were going with this, um, not the uh, detecting RFID tags. But it still, I think, has some uses. John, no, it John doesn't. will disagree. But, uh, no, it doesn't. You know I what? You know what? You know has a really good use a label maker. That's what has a really just put a label, put labels on your boxes, people. That's all you have. You to could do, do that. And it I, doesn't they, they have to walk around like like, hey, look at me. You know. <laughs> you know what? You know what else you could do, John? You could give your son four shiny quarters to go to the arcade with. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, right. Uh, so this is a kind of a roadmap for. Uh, Meta's, I still hate that name, um, Facebook's AR, VR um, hardware for the next couple of years. It's not dead yet. It's like it's like the good old Monty Python sketch. I'm not dead yet. Uh, the VR stuff is still coming out. Um, they've obviously had some setbacks to the tune of like I don't know, a, billion, a couple billion dollars, something like that. I was that. just going to say, these guys, are, these guys are really thinking carefully about how they spend their money, aren't they? Yeah. But uh, there's still a couple headsets in the works. Um, I think the Ray-Bans thing is dead, isn't it? To check on that one again. But uh, they do have some AR, VR headsets coming. I think the Ho or not HoloLens. Why did I say HoloLens? The Quest 3. The Quest 3 is going to be one of those devices. So they, they talk a little bit about that in here. Um, the Quest Pro uh, got kind of demoted. They, they took the price down. I don't think they're quite selling, um, but the Quest 3 uh, is is confirmed, and I think that one's going to have AR capabilities. And once it does, uh, hopefully that at least gets some people thinking about AR again. No. Um, yeah, just I still scroll think down to AR. That picture of that. No, just, just scroll down to that picture. That, this, that picture, yes. No, no. 
no, not that one. The, that one's a depressing the, picture. Go, no, the one above where the, <laughs> the depressing. The, 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 yeah, not that one. Yeah, the top one. Not that you, one. Keep going. That one. Not that. This is all you need to see to know that this won't be successful. <laughs> I don't know how else to put this. People don't. On in generally speaking, people don't want this. I don't know why companies are pursuing this. This is a dumb idea. I'm sorry to say, I don't like these things. I don't know how else I have to say. It. I know that everyone's like, oh, gaming, and you can see your grandpa, and you can, you know, you can, you can <laughs> maps and all that. It's like, yes, I get all that. Let's but go to the look. depressing picture. Oh my god, that's depressing. Like I, you have no like I, I would rather play chess with a person I can talk to, you know. And this is not the reality. Like this is, this is such. This is so like. So, so what's interesting from... is like as much money as um, Facebook has lost or spent over the last couple of years on this, and they, they've obviously pulled back and laid off and all of that, they still run metaverse ads nonstop here. I do not know about TV you watch, but nonstop on my television are meta AR commercials. And the commercials, I agree with you, John, 100%. They are dreadful. They're corny. They're not realistic in any way, shape, or form. They're that typical, like, in the future, like, you know, wishful thinking yeah. what what the metaverse is supposed to be. And it's, it's just awful, awful. And you know they're spending money hand over fist to advertise on these platforms. I know. I, I, I feel – look, I feel like the engineers who are doing – don't get me wrong. The engineers that are doing incredible work. Mm -hmm. But I think at some point, someone has to look up like a meerkat over the horizon and say, is this really taking off? Is this really what people want? And I would say, you look at your sales, look at how much money you're spending on this thing, and no one's buying it, not to the level that's required. I know 20 million, yes, 20 right, million people you know, can't be wrong. Know, John. But, yes, but how much money have they thrown at this problem? Right? Like, I just, I don't understand. I'm sorry. I don't get it. I, I'm been in, I, I'm, I'm hat. Look, I'm sure in how many years time from now, there will be a video clip of me on YouTube where people will be trashing me saying, look at this moron. He didn't see the future. I'm like, fair enough. I didn't see it. But this, I mean, where we are right now with battery technology, like there's just too many physical limitations in play right now. The, the, the weight of these things. Yes. I know you're going to say they're light. Yeah. You know, the, the fidelity, yes, I know you're going to say it's getting better, but just the fact, like, I hate wearing my glasses, and these are super lightweight glasses, and I don't want to wear them. Now you're asking people to put these massive things on their face, and it's like, I've said this before, don't hack my face. Stop trying to hack my face. <laughs> I don't want my face hacked. Leave my face alone. If I want, I'll take a phone, I'll hold it up here, I'll look at it like this, great. But other than that, I don't want things on my face, you know, so. All right, John. Anyway, I'll, I'll I'll move on. <laughs> maybe maybe I can cheer you up with a segment that we haven't had in a while. Can you okay. can you think what that's going to be? I have a. Can it play Doom, John? Uh, this is one of my favorite segments. Can it play Doom? You sure? I mean, yeah. It's first of all the high value quality of production on that that transition. Did, I spent, did, we I didn't, spent a whole yeah. 10 seconds making that one day. I know, but is... we didn't we didn't get rid of the logo, the Kaping or Kawing or whatever who made it no. on that. No. <laughs> it was it was like a service, like one of those uh trans uh, video maker, like stinger yeah, 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 maker yeah, yeah, online yeah. services. And I was like, you know what? This is Keep gonna it. be as yeah. cheaply made as possible, and that's that's gonna be the, yeah. the beauty of it. So I'm keeping it. I'm great. keeping the yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> you know, even the font sucks it's like it's brilliant it's perfect oh yeah, yeah. it's yeah. It, it's doing its purpose it's yeah. serving its purpose so this is on hackaday i thought this was cool john um mm. this is a milliwatt of doom what? so what somebody did is they built um a uh doom they you know doom is open source so they, they uh -huh. basically hacked a version of doom that runs on a processor that is designed as a neural network processor 
So it is a very low power to device that is supposed to be used for um, uh, machine learning processing. So this uh, runs on a uh, milliwatt of power. But what's cool about this, John, is not only is it like is it running Doom, but it is playing Doom. Oh. So it's a very simplified version of Doom. Like I think it's the the level in question here is just like a a box room with like random enemies that spawn, but then yep. the neural network will go like shoot those enemies. But it's all running on uh, a milliwatt of power. It, it is it. It, in here. It is like saying this is a PR stunt to to like talk about their chip. But I thought it was just super cool. Like it's it's not just running Doom; it's actually playing the game too. I I want this to go solo or wind based, and so the game will like <laughs> slow down if the wind goes down or the sun sets. You know, uh, that would be fun. Yeah, it says uh, Doom is running as a uh, on as little as a milliwatt of power. Uh, makes an impressive PR stunt. Uh, perhaps perhaps more interesting is it isn't simply running the game; it is also playing it as a neural network processor. It contains the required smarts to learn how to play the game and a simple circular level uh, in a cir circular level. It's soon picking off the targets with ease. <laughs> so it's got like these targets yeah. running around. Just the yeah. AI is shooting. I thought that was fun. Um, I think I got this one twice on here by accident. Oh, yeah. Uh, we this. talked about this one in the past. Like somebody yeah. um, set up this little tiny screen to run inside a Lego brick to play Doom. Uh, well, somebody took that ball and ran with it, and now there is a uh, motion sensor in the brick, so you can physically pick up the brick and tilt it, nice, nice, and and actually control the game. And you can see they're tapping it to shoot and tap, you yeah. know, tilting it to move. So it has recently got an upgrade. Um, <laughs> and then this next one is a total conversion for Doom, and I thought this was just too cool to not mention. Um, so. Total conversion, if you're not familiar with what oh, that term means. Zelda. Somebody has not only reskinned the game, but made completely new le levels for it, so it plays like an entirely different game. <laughs> and they've remade this Zelda. Awesome. This is awesome. I love this, this is amazing. I love this. <laughs> so they have turned Doom into a first-person version yeah, Zelda. of Zelda yeah, yeah. and faithfully awesome. recreated the graphics, the enemies, and the entire... <laughs> The entire game, pretty much. The map is there. You can oh, play it just like you'd play Zelda, but brilliant. from first person. Love the it. The entire world was rebuilt, including all of the secrets and puzzles. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, this is a phenomenal achievement. Uh, so much work went into this. You can't, can't even imagine like, reskinning wow. all of these things. That's really and, impressive. That is, that, is, yeah. that is the most impressive thing I've seen today. Yes. And I got the twelve sided die. I like that. Cool. Super cool stuff. So uh, if you're into mods, that one is up at mod. DB. I'll take that. I'll take that over a VR AR headset. <laughs> Sorry, I had Are you it. from the past, John? <laughs> yeah, I know. I am. Oh, I'm old. Blame me. I'm old. I don't care. I feel it. I feel mm. it. I, I resemble it. that that's remark. Great. That made me. That made me. That's gonna make. That made my day. Thank you for showing me that. No problem. I thought that was epic. I, I loved it. Mm -hmm. Zelda is one of my favorite games of all time. I keep telling the kids, like, go play the original. It's on your Switch. Go play it. And they're like, hey, it has yep. garbage graphics. I'm like, graphics mean nothing. The game is fun. It's the story. Yep. What yeah. matters is the story. Yep. It is a phenomenal this is game. Hollywood, this is what Hollywood... Hollywood should take a page out of this this book. What matters is the story, not the graphics. Yeah. I'm looking I'm looking at you, DC Universe. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. So. Ouch. Oh come on! You got to, you're telling me they got great storylines going in there. It's they have graphics. neither great stories nor great graphics. <laughs> okay, fair, fair. <laughs> okay, I, I that's think, what I, think I was just off pretty much every every niche genre there is. You know, <laughs> uh, that's what I was thinking I anyway. I don't care. Yeah. I I mean, I I watch these I, things. I'm like, I'm bored already. I don't care. I will give a good movie recommendation though. If you haven't seen it by now, Everything Everywhere All at Once is a phenomenal movie. Okay. You want to talk about a movie that's got the story and the CGI? Uh, you have to check that one out. Okay, I've never heard of that it. That movie is absolutely amazing. Um, 
you'll be thoroughly confused and entertained for at least like the first hour and then it'll start making sense. Okay. Uh, and you're, you're going to be dying to watch the end of it. Uh, it's, it's really great. So if you haven't seen awesome. it, check it out. Uh, with that said, we'll uh, go ahead and leave you with uh, our goodbyes for next week. So um, thanks for another Eat Sleep Code, folks. John, thanks again. No worries. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.